Hello and welcome to the fifth and final day of the European Economic Association Congress. Due to COVID-19, this has been the first ever virtual Congress. And so it's entirely fitting that we conclude with a symposium on the economics of the COVID crisis. I'm delighted to be able to introduce three distinguished panelists who will each speak to different aspects of current events. Our first panelist is Flavia Toxvart from Cambridge University. He started working on the economics of infectious diseases many years prior to the current crisis and will today speak about future challenges for economic epidemiology. Our second speaker is Oriana Bandiera, the Sir Anthony Atkinson Professor at the London School of Economics. Oriana has made important contributions to many areas of applied economics and will today present new findings from Bangladesh on the impact the COVID shock has had on individuals across occupations in that setting and beyond. Our third panelist is Daron Asimoglu, Institute Professor at MIT. Daron will focus his comments on the interplay between the crisis, automation in labor markets and labor market institutions, all areas in which Daron has made numerous important contributions. Each speaker will present for 20 to 25 minutes with slides. And then after Daron's talk, we will open the floor to questions from all via the Zoom chat and Ramesh Vettelingham will moderate the questions through to the speakers. So without further ado, I'll hand over to our first speaker on the, on the panel, Flavio Toxvad. Thank you very much, uh, Imran. Thanks for inviting me to, to participate in this, uh, in this panel. And thanks also to, to Ramesh for uh, gracefully agreeing to, um, to be the ringleader. So I will speak a little bit about uh, economic epidemiology. I thought that since uh, I was tasked with talking about the future challenges, I thought it was useful also maybe just to speak a little bit about what do I think the field is about and what are the main, main approaches that have been taken so far uh, in this literature. So economic epidemiology, until very recently at least, was thought of as the application uh, of tools and ideas from economics to inform uh, public health in the context of infectious diseases. So basically use um, optimization techniques and game theory to inform infection control. More recently, there has been a wave of new literature that also looks a little bit the other direction, which is what are the effects of infectious diseases on the economy at large. So I think it's fair to include uh, both of these, um, of these kind of strands within the uh, economic epidemiology moniker. So in, in the, the literature started maybe in the 1970s, and it was not mainly by public health people, but mainly by um, applied mathematicians or um, uh, you know, operations research people that used uh, economic uh, decision making in the context of mathematical epidemiology models as applications of optimal control theory. But on the whole, these, uh, these contributions that took the, the perspective of a, of a social planner, and so they were looking at centralized decision making where you characterize optimal policies uh, in different contexts, depending on what is the uh, policy instrument uh, at the, say, your disposal, for example, vaccines, anti vaccines, antivirals, or quarantines. In the 1980s, uh, born out of, a, of the um, HIV AIDS crisis, there was a, a decision, a, a, rather a wish to try to understand also behavior in uh, economic epidemiological models. And, and so there was a lot of research going in to try to understand what were the, uh, what were the incentives of individual decision makers. And so the focus changed somewhat from characterizing optimal policy to characterizing what would be um, the equilibrium outcomes in a laissez-faire kind of world where there was no intervention necessarily from policymakers. So you can think of that, those two as being the, the extremes, one of, of full control centrally, another one of, of no control centrally. And more recently, there's been kind of a marriage of those two approaches, which is basically have decentralized decision making, but, but where decision makers, that is the individuals in the populations are somehow incentivized to making certain decisions through policy intervention by the social planner. So I think that although approaches one and two are very well researched by now, uh, approach three is less so, and I will touch upon that later going forward. Uh, I think that's one of the issues that uh, merits more uh, attention going forward. Now, uh, in, in principle, uh, the economic epidemiology models allow for two types of interactions. Uh, I, I call them transition rate interactions versus payoff interactions. So transition rate interactions are those where individuals' decision-making 
influences the payoffs of other people or rather the well-being of other people through transition rates. So for example, if I vaccinate myself, then I basically make it more difficult for another person to become infected. And so I am influencing the transition rate of that individual from the healthy state into the infected state. More recently, there has been a lot of focus and a lot of uh, progress on looking at payoff interactions. So for example, if you want to, uh, to look at a general equilibrium type models where uh, I being ill doesn't just influence other people's probability of becoming infected, but also maybe because I withdraw from the labor market, uh, that may also have interactions with other people's payoffs but they're not transition rate interactions, they are basically economic interactions. And I think one of the major um, additions to, to the economic epidemiology to literature over the last five, five months or so has been uh, exactly on this channel that is to look at interaction through, uh, through payoffs. So what I'm going to do now going forward is I'm going to go through five different avenues that I think are particularly promising uh, they are all going to be, I'm going to use examples of my own work, but I think uh, these are broader points that are, are well, uh, well worth uh, exploring. And, and so the first one is going to be uncertainty about models and parameters. Uh, this is important for uh, policymaking in particular. I'm going to then talk about the microstructure of non-pharmaceutical interventions, try to get under the hood of what we mean when we say social distancing. I'm going to talk a little bit about second best policy interventions and I'm going to give uh, two recent examples um, that, uh, that fall into this category. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about coordination and competition in infection control. That is a situation where you have, for example, uh, different state players trying to uh, control the disease in a world that is interlinked. And last, I'm going to talk a little bit about, if I have time, about interaction between different policy instruments. So for example, whether uh, we want to use different policy instruments in conjunction or uh, face them uh, at different uh, stages of the epidemic. Okay, so let's talk about first um, uncertainty about models and parameters. So the, the one question we, a lot of us have asked ourselves in different contexts is, is what is the optimal lockdown policy? Now, in order to answer this question, we need to write down a model and uh, the overwhelming majority of people have written down the classical SIR model. So the SIR model is a model in which people, once they become uh, recovered from the infection, they basically have um, a permanent immunity to reinfection. So this is indeed one of the, of the standard models in, uh, in epidemiology. Now it so happens that for some of the, of the other uh, uh, coronavirus that we have experienced with in, in, in recent years, such as MERS and SARS, it turns out that immunity typically wanes after one to two years. That means that people who are initially recovered and therefore uh, have some measure of immunity, they actually return to the pool of susceptibles and therefore can be reinfected all over again. Now this turns out to be uh, quite important because policy, what is the, the right policy, depends on what the right model is. Now, why is this a problem? Well, the problem is that we can't know until a year from now, say, whether uh, um, susceptibility has returned or whether immunity still lasts. So this is something that we actually have complete uh, ignorance about uh, until uh, additional knowledge comes in. Okay, and, and, though, and though I'm going to emphasize this particular uncertainty, let me just uh, emphasize that there are other uncertainties that are also important. For example, uh, the infectiousness of the disease, uh, the asymptomatic ratio, uh, heterogeneity by age and, uh, age and gender in terms of susceptibility, and a whole host of other things that we just can't know much about at very early stages of the epidemic. So what I've got done here is uh, this is a, a from recent work that I've done with, uh, with Yanitsaru and Kistler, this is basically plotting two different lines, assuming two different models for the epidemic model. So the solid blue line shows the social, optimal social distancing in the lower panel and the resulting uh, infection trajectory uh, in the upper panel. Uh, and so the blue line is uh, under uh, waning immunity. That is when people become reinfected or can become reinfected after 52 weeks of, um, after having been uh, recovered. The, the, the dotted line shows the equivalent trajectories for the SIR model that is the one with permanent immunity. And, and really the, the, the only point I want to take away from, this, uh, from these two graphs is that it actually matters quite a lot whether you are in one world or another world. 
And because optimal policy is forward looking, we can't just take a wait and see approach and say, well, let's assume that uh, immunity is, is, you know, is, is forever. And then if we learn otherwise, we'll change the track. That's just not an option because the optimal policy is forward looking. So what, what we do here is just point out the difference. Of course, in, in further work, what one would want to do is to build into the model that we have uncertainty about these parameters and then, of course, condition optimal policy on what we learn as we go along. Okay, moving uh, to uh, the microstructure of uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions. So uh, in, in most of the models, and this uh, includes my own work, uh, you know, the, it is assumed that we can somehow scale back social interactions or economic activity, and by doing so, we reduce the, um, the amount of new infection. And mathematically, typically that happens by multiplying some policy variable, uh, multiplying that uh, to the in, uh, infection term. Now, we all understand fairly intuitively what does it mean that we have a complete lockdown. A complete lockdown basically means no interactions, no leaving the home, no being close to other people. So that, that's kind of easy. The complication, it arises once we, we start talking about what is a partial lockdown. So what does it mean that we partially lock down the economy? Does that mean we scale back all activities proportionately? Or does it mean that we only stop some activities, but we allow other activities to take place? So now, of course, uh, we, we need to get into the nitty gritty. And if we want to give policy advice, we need to be uh, careful about what are the activities we allow uh, and which ones do we, we disallow. Um, and so this gives rise to this idea of competing externalities. So I'm going to show you a very simple model that is based on, a, on an older paper of mine, which, uh, which distinguishes between two kinds of contacts. I, I, I call them incidental contacts and essential contacts. So an incidental contact is one that neither can block. So for example, uh, being in an elevator with another person, if the other person doesn't want to be in the elevator, I still get to enjoy my elevator ride. So the other person's absence in some sense doesn't influence my enjoyment of the elevator if, if he or she blocks it. And an essential contact is one where the enjoyment of the, of the, of the situation is uh, predicated on the presence of the other person. So for example, a hairdresser, if the customer doesn't show up, uh, even if, if, uh, if, uh, if the scissors are all sharpened and, and the hairdresser is ready, of course, no, no hair is going to be cut and vice versa. If the hairdresser doesn't show up, then the customer doesn't get a, a haircut. So there, this is a contact in which both of them, either of them can block it by withdrawing from, uh, from this interaction. So mathematically, although I'm not going to spend too much time on it, uh, the enjoyment of the activity is one. And then if both of them are active, that is both of them opt in, that's what the one one stands for, then there is a probability of becoming infected which is a function of whether or not you are infected yourself and whether or not the other person is infected. And B is some disutility from being uh, infected. So the way to analyze this is to just look at uh, indifference curves. So indifference curves in QI, QJ space, this basically shows us what are the combinations of, of pre-meeting probabilities of being infected that would, that would make one or the other individual opt out of this contact. So the red indifference curve shows the situation for individual I, and individual I would opt out whenever the other person is very likely to be infected and would opt in otherwise, and vice versa for the uh, second individual J, whose indifference curve is shown here by the blue line. Now, if we superimpose those two uh, indifference curves, uh, we can now trace out what would happen um, in, uh, in equilibrium. And so on the next slide, I will go through what happens in, in a socially planned environment. So now we have to be careful about whether these are incidental or essential contacts. Now, remember that each individual can always opt out. And so what happens now is that whenever we're above the red line or, oops, or below the blue line, there will be at least one person who will wish to opt out. And that means that if these are incidental contacts where my presence it does not influence your enjoyment of opting in, if I, leave, if, I, if I don't go in, then in equilibrium, whenever we're above the red line or below, below the blue line, 
in equilibrium, there will only be one person present. Now, in the two extremes, when there is either very low probabilities of becoming inf of being infected, or, in, or both are very likely to be infected, in those cases, everybody's happy to, uh, to have the contact because there's very low probability of, of infection transmission. So this is what uh, in the ACE literature is called um, being zero concordant. That is, you have the same infection status. Now, what happens when the contact is essential? Now, when the contact is essential, the, in, the incentive constraints of each individual are unchanged, but the difference is now that if I opt out, then you can't get a payoff even if you opt in. And so what happens now under essential contacts is that when you're above the red line or below the blue line, nothing happens. There is no transaction taking place because one of the two people blocked it. Now we can turn to, um, to the um, social planning and the, the black line shows the indifference curves or rather the, I, the ISO welfare curves of the social planner. And what this shows is that under incidental contacts, the social planner would only want there to be contact when people are very, very small probability or extremely high probability of being infected already. In, in other words, the social planner is more conservative than individuals because it factors in the negative externality that individuals have on each other. And so in this little triangle here and the little triangle there, in equilibrium there will be contact, but the social planner would rather that there wasn't the contact. Now this should be contrasted with the uh, one on the right. The one on the right uh, is, the, is the case when you have essential contacts. And as you can see, the ISO welfare curve of the social planner now, it cuts in a different place. What happens now is that is, there's a secondary externality, namely that if I don't want to play ball, I basically block uh, the other person from also playing ball. Okay, so this is, for example, the situation in uh, sexually transmitted, transmitted diseases uh, where one, of, one or the other individual can, uh, can you know, withdraw consent to a contact. And in those cases, what, what we see here is that in this little triangle there and that one there and the equivalent up here, the social planner would want there to be contact, but the individuals would want, or one or the other individuals would rather block the contact. So think of it this way, if everyone on the highway had to, to drive with the speed that made the most risk averse person comfortable, then everything would slow down and that might actually be uh, socially suboptimal. We would like to find some kind of compromise. And so the takeaway point from this is that the socially optimal policies for these two kinds of contacts are different. We should encourage some and discourage others. And it's also, uh, it's gratifying to note that in, in actual practical policy work, this is something that has been uh, uh, acknowledged. For example, the, throughout the lockdown in the UK, uh, there was a primary school uh, teaching for kids of children, uh, sorry, for children of people who are essential workers. So there it was, it was believed that the positive externality of keeping those kids in school on society as a whole were strong enough to counterweigh the additional risks of infection that we were um, exposing uh, their teachers to. Okay, so now I'd like to move on to uh, second best policy interventions. I have two examples there, uh, and, and, and I'd like to just use this to kind of emphasize that once you move away from a uh, first best world that can be perfectly implemented, uh, policy becomes very uh, delicate and we can actually have policies that backfire. So the first example, there's no model worked out here yet, but uh, in, in March 2020, the London Underground reduced the services uh, and the idea was to cater only for essential workers. And uh, reportedly, uh, the idea was that they want to reduce um, uh, number of contacts or rather number of infections that, uh, that would take place uh, on the London Underground. Now, what does that reduction in, in service ha has, uh, have in as, as an effect? Well, the first effect is that it reduces the quality of service. And that means that fewer people will opt in and choose to use the London Underground because it's now you know, less frequent. Now, the second effect, of course, is that it reduces the service rate. So the people who do opt to travel will spend more time in crowds waiting for infrequent trains. And in, in effect, this is what happened. And uh, one can think of that as being somewhat of a backfiring policy it was actually so bad, there were pictures in all the newspapers of people standing on top of each other, 
um, and the mayor of London had to urge people to stop using the train. They said, I cannot say this more strongly, we must stop all non-essential use, ignoring these rules means lives lost. Okay, so this is just an example of a, of a well-meaning policy that might not have worked out quite as intended. The second such example uh, is drawn from a paper I published last year on, on rational disinhibition. And the idea here is simply that uh, there may be multiple different tools at our disposal to protect ourselves. Uh, we can think, for example, as being uh, in a world in which we can uh, both um, socially distance, and that's the, our main tool, but then suddenly there's an innovation, which is that everybody suddenly has to wear face masks. So what, what does that do to incentives? Well, if everybody wear, wears face masks, that would slightly reduce the probability of becoming infected, and hence that might actually encourage us to increase our uh, exposure levels uh, on the margin, and all other things equal, that could actually lead to more exposure and hence to more uh, infection, and whether or not this actually uh, decreases overall social welfare will depend uh, delicately on the strength of externalities. And so this is ultimately uh, an empirical question. Okay, the, the, the penultimate one I, I want to touch upon is uh, coordination and competition for, uh, in infection control. So we all know that the COVID-19 is a quintessentially global problem. It started locally in China in Wuhan province, but now it's something that everybody has to, to grapple, grapple with because of tourism and trade and so forth. Now, unfortunately, there is only very, only very limited coordination across countries and regions. There is some, but nowhere far, far much, uh, nowhere enough. In the UK and the US, by design, uh, many of the, of the decisions on lockdowns are actually taken at the local level. So for, a, for, for example, Wales and Scotland does not need to follow the same pattern uh, as England, and in the US, the states are also responsible for much of this policy, okay? So what we have is basically what is called the weakest link game, where the least uh, active player uh, has a disproportionate uh, effect on the overall success of the, of the policy. And so one thing I think is very important is to understand these linkages better and to design better mechanisms to enable coordination and align incentives in these kinds of settings. Okay, and the last thing I want to note, uh, mention is uh, interaction between instruments. So uh, in much of my work, I've looked at just one instrument. Let's just look at social uh, distancing. Let's look at lockdowns. Let, let's look at vaccination. And then we characterize what is the optimal policy uh, and then we move on. Now, in many cases, uh, we have more than one pharmaceutical intervention and sometimes non-pharmaceutical intervention at our disposals. And, and so it becomes an, an important question, how do we optimally use those to combat the infectious disease? So I have written two papers, one that looks at social distancing versus treatment uh, with Bob Rothorn and another recent paper where we look at treatment versus vaccines. But <clears throat> in principle, one can look at it with any, any set of policy instruments. So questions that we want to ask ourselves is, are these instruments substitutes or complements? Would we want to use them equally much throughout the epidemic? Would we want to face them across the stages? And also, what is the extent to which public and private measures are crowding each other out? So for example, could we have a situation where the public institutes some policies and that actually crowds out private uh, um, protective behavior so that uh, the policy becomes ineffectual. These are the things we would like to uh, understand. Just to, uh, to conclude, uh, the, the literature on economic epidemiology is, is rich and it's exciting and has a long history. And uh, me, perhaps more than anyone, is super excited that, uh, that so many people now uh, are working in this field. There's a variety of topics that should, in principle, interest all sorts of economists micro people, macro people, uh, public health, of course, but also public economics people. It is a very, very interdisciplinary field. And so it is on, very important to understand the biology. Uh, just taking the SIR or, uh, model off the shelf uh, can be misleading. Uh, sometimes diseases have quirks that need to be understood. And uh, you know, enlisting the help of epidemiologists can be hugely useful in some sense. Uh, us taking the models of epidemiology and just running with them might be a little bit like um, like epidemiologists thinking that ISLM uh, or the the, the 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 standard growth model is is what all economics is about 
uh, without actually understanding some of the subtleties of the of the uh, more recent research. Now, if you're interested in the kind of of the uh, in the uh, in the early papers in this literature, I invite you to uh, consult my papers. I've gone out of my way to actually reference these early contributions from the 70s and 80s forward. So, uh, if you're interested uh, in the early literature and contributions, uh, I invite you to consult uh, those papers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Flavio. That's dead on time. And wonderful to have that overview from someone who's been thinking about the economics of infectious diseases for so much longer than most of us. And, and glad to hear you're, you're feeling less lonely in that field uh, in, the, in, the, in the last six months. Um, while we're getting uh, Oriana's slides um, set up, let me remind you that if you'd like to put questions, there are three options. You can use the Q&A, you can use the chat, or you can uh, raise your hand at the end uh, by clicking in the, uh, the right-hand panel and we could come to you uh, live and you could put your question to uh, any or all of the, uh, of the speakers. Uh, Oriana, are, uh, are you all set? I'm all set, can you see my screen? We can indeed. Wonderful, thank you very much. And thank you for, to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, so this is uh, um, joint work, based on joint work with Robin Burgess and Imran Mateen. And uh, we're, I'm gonna tell you something about jobs in the time of COVID, presenting you some evidence from the field, specifically from Bangladesh. Um, the, the analysis is based on a survey done by the Brack Institute of Governance and Development, together with PPRC, which is another NGO in Bangladesh. Uh, they had the very brilliant idea of sampling two large representative surveys, a rural survey and an urban survey, right after the lockdown was imposed in Bangladesh in April, and they interviewed 7,000 and more households, 7,600 households by phone. They were interviewed three times uh, in June, sorry, they were interviewed two times in April and June, and in both occasions they were asked about their outcomes in February, just before the crisis. So we have an outstanding amount of uh, information on the labor market, the earnings of these households um, right after the COVID shock. So the first thing that we see is an enormous increase in poverty. Of course, these are poor households to start with, but from February to June, the share of people below the national poverty line went from 36 to 73 okay. percent. So the goal of the analysis today is to understand how the effect of the COVID shock depends on the jobs that these people were doing and perhaps more subtly how the jobs that people are doing change after the shock. To do so we will classify occupations in three broad groups that differ in the risk commitment profile, because in times that are so uncertain as these, risk and uncertainty is the key issue. So we will distinguish between people who are in formal salaried employment, that is individuals who sell labor to the same employer in exchange for pay for an agreed period of time. The second category is self-employed business, uh, we will distinguish between farming and other because in rural areas we will have farmers, in urban areas not. Uh, this is uh, the type of occupation where individuals combine labor and capital to produce goods and services that they sell on the market. And finally, the least certain of the three categories is casual employment or day labor, where individuals sell labor daily to different employers without any guarantee of further employment. Notice that the same type, the same job, say transport worker, can belong to all these three groups. You could have a contract as a chauffeur for a household. You could be self-employed that is own your own car and run a taxi business. Or you could be working, you know, day by day, giving rights to people who ask you to do that. So the first set of results will show you how the effect of COVID on earnings depend on the job that you were doing a baseline. Okay. So the first thing that we see 
So these graphs are always organized by areas. So one is urban areas and two is rural areas. And uh, the points are the, the estimates and the bars are the 95% confidence intervals. So what we see here is the percentage drop in income between February and June for the four different types of occupations. So you see that in urban areas, business owners and casual workers lost half of their earnings. This includes both the extensive and the intensive margin. So it's both uh, zero earnings and reduced earnings. Salaried workers lost a lot less, lost about 30%. If we look in rural areas, again, casual workers are the ones who lost the most. They lost about half of their income. Farming and salaried labor did slightly better. Now, interestingly, and because these people differ in their baseline wealth, the difference between business owners and casual workers is that the former can actually maintain expenditure levels because they have their savings that they can rely upon to maintain expenditure levels. Whereas casual workers, both in urban and rural areas, are the ones that reduce expenditures the most. So have a higher elasticity of earnings, of expenditure to earnings. Now, what I think, so clearly the effect of the shock depends on the occupation, the type of structure of occupation that uh, people were engaged in a baseline. What we want to understand better is the effect that the shock had on the availability of these occupations and on the occupational choice that people made. So this is what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the presentation. The effects of COVID on jobs. So in these graphs, we compare the main occupation before and during COVID, again in rural and urban areas. These are urban areas and these are rural. And we compare the three months for which we have data, which is February, April, and June. And a few patterns are quite striking in these graphs. The first is that the share of people who have businesses falls, more so in urban than in rural areas. You see here, it goes from 30% of people having a business in February to 20% in April and June. So some businesses disappear. And this is replaced by both salaried labor, the second bar, and casual labor. So there is a movement from self-employment into uh, labor. But I think the most interesting thing is that actually the averages hide a lot of churning. That is, the, the total number of businesses uh, has decreased by one third. But there's been a lot of change also in the other categories. So you see here, starting from the bottom, 61% of the businesses in February survive till June. 30% move into casual labor. Strikingly, there is a lot of movement from casual labor to salaried labor and vice versa. So 30% of people who are doing casual jobs in February are now into salary jobs and 24% of those who were doing salary jobs are now in casual jobs. So when we look at the effect of uh, COVID, of the COVID shock on outcomes by occupational baseline, we do not have the full picture because the occupational baseline determines what you're going to do after the COVID shock. So what we're interested in now is to understand who changes occupation. And there are two margins that we're going to look at. The first is the earnings in the occupation. That is, are the best businesses that the best business owners that go bust, or are the least uh, earning, the ones with the lowest earnings that go bust? So this is what we do in this slide. So it's the same transition graph. But instead of giving you the percentage, we give you the earnings in February. 
So again, starting from the bottom, we see that the businesses that stay in business are the ones that were earning the most. So the average earnings in February were 16,000 takas. And those that go out of business and the owner move on to casual labor were earning 5,000 takas less. Okay. These are monthly earnings before the crisis. If you look at salaried labor, the people who stay in salaried labor, again, are the ones that were earning the most, and the ones who were earning less moved to casual labor. For casual labor, it's the other way around. The ones who stay are the ones with the worst jobs. So they were earning about 12,000 takas, and those that were earning more move into salaried labor. If you look at the occupations into more details, the ones that are left in casual labor are day laborers in constructions or agriculture. The more skilled occupations, like uh, tutors, teachers, um, other skilled occupations, transport workers, are those who move more easily between the two categories. So this suggests that there is some efficiency in the sense, at least for businesses, that it is the least profitable that go out. But there is another dimension which is important and can go in the opposite direction, and that is baseline wealth. We have data on wealth, that is the sum value of assets that these households have uh, well before the shock. This is a baseline a couple of years before. And then we see that it is the richest owners that can keep their businesses and it is the poorest that move into casual labor. And likewise, it is the richest salaried workers that keep their job, and it is the poorest that move into casual labor. Once we look at casual labor, it goes the other way around. Okay? The ones who stay in casual labor are the poorest, and the ones who manage to move from casual labor to salary jobs are actually richer. So there is a lot of churning, and the churning is determined both by the income that you had in that occupational baseline, as well as your baseline wealth. Now let me show you what happens in rural areas. The graph gets a lot more complicated because we have four occupations. Uh, the points to notice are that farming is the most stable. So people who were farming before COVID are still farming after. And salaried labor is the least stable. There is a lot of movement. And if you look again at the earnings and at the wealth that these people had uh, before the movement, it follows similar patterns as we saw in urban areas. The businesses that were earning more are more likely to remain in business, and those that were earning less are more likely to go into casual labor. And importantly, again, among the casual workers is those who were earning the least that remain casual workers. Those who were earning more move into salaried labor. We look at wealth and we find a very similar pattern. It's the richest business owners that uh, remain in business, and the poorest one moves to casual labor, and likewise for casual labor is the poorest that remain and the richest manage to get salary jobs. Now, this put together can have two consequences which we explore directly. The first is on inequality, because if we get people moving around um, occupations according to wealth and according to earnings, there's going to be more polarization if it's the best businesses that remain and the worst people, the least, uh, the lower earning people remaining in casual labor, the difference between these uh, two groups is going to uh, grow. And likewise, because it's the poorest people who remain in casual labor move to casual labor, whereas the wealthiest stay in business, 
there can be an increase in inequality in earnings by wealth as well. And the second dimension is the access to social assistance, because social assistance is uh, almost non-existent for the informal sector, the definition you don't know where these people are. So the movement of richer people towards more salary jobs might mean that the inequality in access to social assistance will increase. And the second issue is one of misallocation. Because if, as we've seen, wealth determines whether you keep a business or not, other things equal, a wealthier owner will be able to keep a business which a poorer owner will not be able to keep, which means that some worse businesses run by wealthy owners will survive, whereas some better businesses owned by poorer owners will go bust. So to provide evidence on this, with the next slide, we show you an earnings wealth frontier, I call it for levers. The first one is for urban areas and the second one is for rural areas. And what we do here is that we divide the wealth in uh, 50 bins. And for each bin, we calculate the earnings of the, so the 90th percentile of earnings of those who left. So for the poorest people, you see that the 90th percentile of earnings, so the best businesses of, that went past, were earning 17,000 tacos a month. For the richest, that number is 14,000 tacos. So that suggests misallocation because the survival of the business depends on initial wealth and uh, poorest owners, uh, profitable businesses run by poorest owners are more likely to go bust. We can look at the other side because business, some businesses went bust and some new ones were created. So if we look at the new businesses that were created, you see this is taken from the other side. So this is the 10th uh, decile of uh, earnings of new businesses that didn't exist in February and were opened in June. You see that that's also decreasing in wealth, meaning that to enter the market uh, with a new businesses, with a new business, a poor owner will need a business that earns more than what a rich owner needs. So the shock created churning in the type of uh, occupation that people were engaged in. And as a result, because the churning was correlated with wealth, he also created some misallocation in the, in the businesses that people were running. This next slide looks at the inequality of earnings by wealth quintile. Uh, again, this is uh, one is urban and two is rural. You see that if you compare this, the omitted category is the first wealth quintile, and these are average earnings by wealth quintiles. You see both in urban and in rural areas, the points, they just fan out. And especially the difference between the fifth quintile and the first, which is the omitted category, increases from 1,500 to 2,200 in urban areas and from about zero to 1,500 in rural areas. So there is an increase in inequality in earnings across the wealth distribution. And final result, Salaried workers who are the wealthiest get more social assistance, while casual workers who are the poorest get less. And that might be one reason for why rich people move into salaried work. So these two graphs here give you the probability of getting some social assistance by the government in urban and rural, and the amount of social assistance that you get. Uh, two points are of note. Uh, we see that the probability of getting social assistance is much higher in urban areas. It's easier to find people there. And the amount is much higher too, on average. But most importantly, 
the amount that salaried workers get is higher than uh, both businesses and casual labor, and especially casual labor. So casual labor, who's uh, the job of the poorest people, is also the one that gets lowest social assistance. Now, this is not unique to Bangladesh. This comes from another uh, type of work that I'm doing using the Aspire data by the World Bank, which is a data set that contains information on all social assistance programs around the world. And what this graph plots is the benefit incidence in the first quintile, so the share of benefits that go to the poorest 20% of the population, against the share of formal employment. And you see that in countries where form, the share of formal employment is low, targeting is worse. Because again, the, the point is that it's very hard to target social assistance to workers that you don't know where they are. So summing up, we find that the effect of the shock depends on the type of the job that you have. And that as a consequence, plus, plus, I don't have a randomization, but plus it did, as a consequence, people change jobs because people try to avoid the worst consequences of COVID. This means that wealthier people get better jobs and more social assistance, which leads to inequality and misallocation. So if the shock by itself weren't bad enough, it also makes the inequality and misallocation worse. Uh, the policy challenges, of course, is that uh, we want to target resources to the poorest workers. These are mostly unskilled. And social assistance programs that support consumption are unlikely to work, both because they tend to be mistargeted, but also tend to be short term. So what we do need is programs that get people into better jobs and that help good poor entrepreneurs keep their businesses. And this has the bonus that it also would help efficiency by addressing this allocation. The question is how to do this, and I don't have an answer to that. I'll leave it to their own to hopefully give us an answer. For thank sure, you. yes. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Ariana, for that. Uh, great that you were able to take the opportunity of your, of your previous work in Bangladesh to uh, start doing some work on the impact of COVID. Um, as, as many uh, um, participants will know, uh, Oriana invented or was the creator of the hashtag what economists really do. And it was said to me um, by someone senior in the uh, connected with the UK government recently that COVID has really given a, a fantastic opportunity for economists to shine and show the, the contribution they can make to uh, understanding the world and, and, and um, coming up with policy responses. Uh, Daron, are you all set to go? I'm all set to go. Thank you, Ramesh. And, uh, Thanks for organizing it, everybody. Uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here following on the great talks by Flavio and uh, Oriana. And thanks Imran and the EEA for organizing it and Ramesh for uh, heading it. So I'm going to give a uh, somewhat different but hopefully complementary perspective. So I'm going to think about how we could start thinking about remaking the post-COVID world. And this inevitably involves going back a little bit and uh, identifying where some of the fault lines uh, that we had before COVID lie. And I'm gonna focus on the uh, more developed economies, partly because I think Oriana has already uh, covered a lot uh, of the developing country challenges. So let me start with this chart. This is for the US. The data I'm going to show you just for a shortage of time is just going to be from the US, but several of these patterns are in a somewhat less uh, pronounced way are true for Canada, much of uh, Western Europe. So uh, here what I'm showing you is what's happened to labor demand in the US economy over the last seven decades. The measure I'm showing is the wage bill growth of, or the wage bill of the private sector. Uh, and it's normalized by population so that it's not driven by population changes. And, uh, and it's essentially as a measure of how much the US private sector is paying to workers. The chart on the left is for the four decades following World War II. And it's a remarkable chart because it shows a very steady increase. It's about a two and a half percentage point a year 
uh, faster than population growth. So which means that essentially with a, uh, more or less stable employment, you're going to have over 2% real wage growth for workers. And that's essentially what happened in the US economy. On the right, you see the same thing for the last three decades. So first you see a slowdown and then an essential flattening out from the late 1990s onwards. So for all practical purposes, the US private sector is not paying much more to businesses, to, to workers than it did in the uh, 1990s. This of course has many sweeping implications. For one, the decline in the labor share in uh, national income, but even more importantly, perhaps, it is intimately linked to the changes in the wage structure. So here I'm showing the real wage evolution of 10 demographic groups by gender and by education. And what you see is that during the decades, again, that followed World War II here, I'm starting it from the 1960s where higher quality data are available, but it's true even before 1960. So it's all the way to the 1970s, uh, end of 1970s, real wages of all 10 demographic groups are growing pretty much in tandem at that uh, greater than 2% real rate a year. So uh, this is a period of a rising tide lifting all boats uh, and everybody seems to be benefiting from economic growth, productivity growth and other institutional arrangements. But from sometime around the late 1970s, early 1980s, you see a sea change. You see the fanning out of all of these, uh, the bottom, uh, ones, of course, are the lower education groups. So the gap between low and higher education groups are increasing. And that again is uh, shared by many developed nations, but something unique to the US and the UK, actually you also see real wage declines for low education groups, especially in the US, which is very pronounced. If you look at low education, high school dropout or high school graduate men, the red and the orange lines, uh, you see that their real wages are falling more than 20 percent from the early 1980s to today. So this of course has huge uh, social costs, not least in terms of the disillusionment and the political backlash that we are getting from all of these major changes. For uh, something like this has many causes. Institutional causes are important. I'll come back to them. Trade is an important part of it. But my own research with Pascual Restrepo has also emphasized that some important elements of this are driven by the changes in the nature of technology. And here, what I'm doing is I am classifying technologies into two groups or their effects, displacement and reinstatement. So displacement is essentially what automation technologies do. They, dip, uh, they uh, displace workers from the tasks that they were uh, previously pr uh, producing. And as a result, this is going to lead to lower labor share and essentially lower labor demand. That's shown by the dashed line on the left and the thick uh, and the, uh, the black line on top is the effects of reinstatement, new occupation, new tasks and things that reinstate workers into the production process in a central way. You see that during the 40 years following World War II, there is relatively rapid uh, advances in automation, but it's broadly counterbalanced by the black line. And one way of seeing that is that the thick blue line in the middle, which is the sum of the two, is hovering around zero. And that's partly re responsible for, or largely responsible for why productivity growth translated into uh, wage growth or into wage bill growth. But on the right, again, you see a big change. Over the last 30 years, the dashed line goes faster down and the black line is increasing much less. And as a result, the sum of the two, the thick blue line is heading south. This, this explains the bulk of the slowdown in labor demand that I showed in the previous picture. Of course, this is an aggregate decomposition, but if you want to get more into the specific technologies that make up automation, you can also do so. So here, drawing on some other work that I did with Pascual Restrepo, I'm showing what happened in local labor markets that were more exposed to industrial robots, a quintessential automation technology, although I would argue one of the more productive ones. So in fact, some of the implications of other automation technologies may be more uh, problematic for labor demand. But even with uh, industrial robots, which are fairly central now for manufacturing processes, you see that the places that are more exposed to them, they have experienced much lower wage growth and much lower employment growth. And, uh, and here you see the places that are most exposed are uh, the heartland of uh, industrial manufacturing, 
uh, Detroit for cars, some of the other places for electronics or petrochemical, they are also, also the areas that have performed worse in terms of employment over the last 25, 30 years. Now, AI might be different. In fact, it has the capacity to be different because AI is a very broad platform. So if you want to actually produce lots of new ways of doing things that are uh, good for reinstating labor, AI could be a very important tool. But uh, evidence from some recent work that I'm doing indicates that much of AI to date, especially over the last five years, has been very much used for automation for, for example, uh, performing tasks for in white collar jobs that can be performed by algorithms. Now, what the reaction, if I show this, and I have uh, to people in, uh, in Silicon Valley, for example, their reaction would be sure, but that's the inevitable path of technology. This is what technology wants. This is what technology dictates. Uh, but my research uh, also takes, uh, uh, takes, uh, takes a different interpretation. There's nothing inevitable about this path. In fact, the automation, uh, uh, the, 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 the emphasis on automation that we have seen is a choice of government policies and corporate policies. In particular, it has uh, very much been fueled by the business models of many large companies. It cannot be a, uh, a coincidence that the US economy is dominated by large tech companies whose uh, business model is very much centered on uh, algorithms and machines replacing what troublesome humans do. Global competition may have uh, contributed. Uh, education system has, may have contributed by not providing the skills to workers that would have been necessary for new tasks and new occupations. But also uh, work I've done with uh, Andrea Manera and Pascual Restrepo highlights that government policies have been very important. One dimension of this is that in, in the US, and again, this is true to a lesser, but to still an important degree in many other countries is that we actually subsidize companies to adopt machines instead of humans. One way of seeing that is to look at how uh, labor versus machines are taxed. So the blue line is on top is the labor taxation over the last 40 years. It's essentially been taxed about 25% a year. This is a combination of income taxes and payroll taxes, employer taxes. But if you look at capital, it's always been taxed more lightly, but it has become much, much more lightly taxed over the last 20 years. And this is especially true for the types of capital uh, that is involved in automation, equipment and software. So you see that those are now getting close to zero taxation as a result of both tax evasion. A lot of companies have shifted their status to S corporations, declines in income tax rates, corporate tax rate, but also majorly because of hugely generous depreciation allowances that essentially enable firms not to pay taxes on, on a lot of their profits. So these are all things that were going on before the COVID, but the post-COVID world is now set to deepen them. There is now one more factor encouraging automation, social distancing and vulnerability to the virus. Uh, so machines have gain another competitive advantage. And in fact, in recent surveys, most companies say that they are either taking active steps or they are considering to take steps to increase automation. As this survey shows, over 75% of companies are in that packet. Many robot companies in, uh, report increasing orders. Now, of course, one thing we can do here, and it's very important in, in many uh, places, including the US, the UK, and Canada, is to increase the, uh, uh, the protection for low wage workers who are the ones who are suffering uh, harsh conditions and uh, declines in real wages. In the US, for example, the real value of the minimum wage is down to essentially 30% of what it used to be four decades ago. Collective bargaining of workers has fizzled. So it is important to redress some of this imbalance between capital and labor, which of course is not unrelated to the very asymmetric taxation and other policies for capital and labor that I have shown. However, very uh, much ignored in some of the policy debates is that there is not much that labor market institutions can achieve once we have come to this point. Because if, uh, if in, fa in fact, as I have argued, automation has become much more the focus of technological development and technology adoption, and we are at the, at the verge of even more automation technologies, the moment you start increasing real value of the minimum wage or other things, that's going to encourage firms to adopt more automation technologies and start shedding more labor. Uh, 
So therefore, uh, labor market institutions cannot be an effective tool unless we do something even more radical, which is to start thinking of a bigger institutional overhaul that involves redirecting technological change. Now that's a very, uh, uh, that's not a very popular idea among policymakers and among many economists because we think that technology has its own path and the ability of the government to interfere and, uh, and, 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 and influence the direction of technological change is, is a fanciful idea in some research, but not really that much of political or economic reality. But I think that's actually not the case. There is no need for the future to be fully automated. And even though digital technologies have really improved our lives, especially in the midst of the COVID crisis, there is all the reasons to think that the market is selecting not the optimal mix of different types of technologies. So there are many decisions that we can do as companies, societies, and government policies to decide how technology is going to be used. And that a lot of this goes to a different institutional framework. Now, this is not entirely fanciful because we have many examples in history, not least in the area of climate change, which I can talk about in the Q&A if there are questions, where the direction of technological change has been majorly influenced by government policies. But it does require major changes. So can we get there? Well, at some level, yes, we are in the midst of what Jim Robinson and I called a critical juncture in why nations fail. Existing institutions have been shown to be inappropriate for dealing with the challenges. And there will there is a lot of... Uh, possibilities and the sorts of coalitions that form institutions that we draw upon, ideas, views, uh, uh, aspirations we draw upon are going to determine which directions we change. But on the other hand, there are special challenges in this process. The pandemic has not only shown that our institutions are not up to the task, but they have also deepened some of these problems. Uh, in the US, again, this is the easiest to see, but also in the UK, for example, we have seen in the US and the UK, to some degree, some parts of Western Europe, a lot of erosion of expertise and autonomy in institutions. In the US, for instance, it cannot be a coincidence that the CDC, which was uh, you know, very expert in dealing with the uh, Ebola epidemic uh, less than a decade ago, has completely failed in the face of something that should have been really routine because this is you know, the bread and butter of epidemiologists after especially you see how severely, the, how quickly the, the virus was spreading in China. And accompanied with that, there's a huge collapse in trust in institutions, which means that it's very difficult to convince at least some portion of society to get on board with fundamental institutional changes. And in fact, there is a bit of a uh, conundrum here. You would expect that trust in state and governments is highest in places that are democratic when people participate in decision making. But when you look at uh, cross-sectional, cross-country data, uh, trust in governments and states seems to be highest in author authoritarian places. It's highest in China and Singapore. Turkey is actually very high despite you know, pitiful performance in every dimension of public good provision, economics, uh, and of course, security. And it's actually much lower in places like Taiwan, France, South Korea, Spain, and so on. So this is not unrelated to what Timur Kuran called preference falsification. There's ideological uh, brainwashing as well as people convincing themselves that those are the right views to, to hold, but it really deepens this problem of how do you actually engage in a fundamental institutional overhaul when uh, people exactly where these overhaul is possible in democratic countries are actually very, uh, very suspicious for the politicians, leaders, and, and institutions. Nonetheless, I think whether we make explicit choices or not, there are broad patterns that we cannot avoid. Either we're gonna try to patch up the institutions that we have already, that's what I've called tragic business as usual, and I think that's going to be disastrous for the reasons that I have highlighted in the context of automation technology jobs, but even uh, more fundamentally, it's also problematic about where we're gonna go in terms of uh, 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 political institutions and democracy, we can run long, learn the wrong lessons. You know, China has certainly been much more successful in containing the epidemic uh, than the United States or the UK. And, and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and the previous slide shows that uh, the Chinese state's 
garners more trust and uh, and cooperation from its citizens, at least superficially. So we can learn the, the wrong lessons. And certainly there are constituencies in the US and the UK and in other uh, advanced countries that actually are, are uh, asking for more authoritarian approaches, weaker media freedom, uh, not so much emphasis on civil liberties and democratic participation. But actually, I think uh, that's a China light strategy because uh, uh, one of the major aspects of the Chinese success is the uh, bureaucratic efficiency of uh, of the Chinese uh, civil service, which is something that has evolved for almost 2,500 years under a, uh, an, an, uh, an, an authoritarian despotic state structure and has learned how to be effective despite that. You know, when you try to emulate China in the West right now, you're going to actually uh, only emulate the easy parts of it, which is clamp down on the media, clamp down on civil liberties, but you're not going to be able to improve CDC's performance or EPA's performance. So the China light would actually be quite disastrous. The third possibility, uh, which I think there's a lot of support for it in the United States would be, I think in my opinion, as dangerous as the first two, if not more, which is to learn another wrong lesson to say that <clears throat> actually all of this shows that the government doesn't work, the government is not competent, the government doesn't understand technology, so we should uh, uh, transfer more authority to uh, tech companies and, uh, and they start taking on more of the responsibilities of the government, uh, whether it is during the pandemic in terms of tracing, uh, information sharing, and so on and so forth, or whether it is outside of the pandemic. But of course, I have already indicated, again, in the context of automation and the labor market, what the costs of too much emphasis uh, on technology at the expense of other things and too much uh, trust in the big tech companies has brought. And I think, again, we could go into greater de uh, details on what the challenges that this would pose for inequality, for the future of democracy, for the future of free speech, and so on and so forth. So I think, uh, therefore, we really should pin our hopes on something else, which I, uh, for lack of a better term, I've called welfare state 3.0, which is a very, uh, very much learning from the successes and the failures of past welfare states, the early ones that evolved after the Great Depression and the end of World War II, uh, some of the successes, but many of the failures that took place after uh, more market incentives were uh, attempted to be brought into the welfare state, but in some sense in a much more, uh, much more uh, bro much broader way than the previous welfare states, because what we need actually is not just a better safe social safety net, that's very important, and those were the, uh, the two pillars of the welfare state 1.0, were things uh, like the social safety net, uh, protection of workers, and so on, and macroeconomic management for stability, but now we need much greater set of responsibilities from the welfare state. This includes combating inequality through the redirection of technological change, as I've mentioned, that's a much more complex thing. Uh, combating climate change, dealing with pandemics and uh, things that are going to happen in a much more connected world. And of course, the more variegated security challenges that we're dealing with. So many more responsibilities and burdens on the shoulders of the state and this well new welfare state will have to deal with them. So, but th what that means is that it will also become harder to understand, incentivize and control the state. And that actually worries many people today and worried many of the leading thinkers of the, of the age when Welfare State 1.0 was being launched. So Frederick Hayek, for example, uh, an alma mater, uh, was a member of the alma, my alma mater or Oriana's current institution, London School of Economics, a recent emigre from Vienna who had fled the Nazis, when uh, Britain in the middle of the war published the beverage report, which was a template for the Britain's own welfare state and very much forward looking uh, document that had national minimum wage, health insurance, progressive taxation, uh, aid for children uh, from uh, families that did not have enough income, worker protections and so on. Uh, many people embraced that with open arms and was very enthusiastic of it in the darkest hours of the war in the United Kingdom. But Hayek was very worried because he thought this was the first step towards totalitarianism. He thought, well, how would 
the UK be very different if the government had the ability to set wages, decide who gets insurance and who gets aid and so on and so forth. And that's what uh, became the basis of an essay that he wrote uh, and then that turned into one of the most influential political economy books of the last century they wrote to serve them. But at the end, despite his brilliance, it turned out that Hayek was wrong. None of the things that he was afraid actually happened nowhere in the Western world. In fact, as I have explained earlier on, the Western world had its best four decades under the auspices of the welfare state. There has never been any other period during which productivity growth was so fast. There has never been any other four decades where inequality declined despite such uh, rapid growth and growth generally has been inclusive, bringing income and voice to many disadvantaged communities. This is essentially the uh, essence of the success of the welfare state, in my opinion. And it is due to what Jim Robinson and I called in our more recent book, The Narrow Corridor, The Red Queen Effect. The reason why Hayek's fears did not materialize or Hayek's uh, forecast was wrong, because Hayek thought if you make the state have greater responsibilities, it's also going to become harder to control. But essentially the framework that Jim and I uh, sort of outlined and summarized in this figure says, actually that depends on the balance between state and society. If the state becomes stronger, you can also make society stronger. Society itself can be more actively participatory in, uh, in democracy. It can take a greater interest. It can have its voice and, and protection of its rights much more central. And that's essentially what happened in the Western world. So in terms of the uh, title of the book, we remain in the narrow corridor because just like Alice in the Wonderland's Dread Queen effect, society ran as fast as the state. But what that means is that if we're going to replicate that sort of success, we also need the society and our democracy to become ever deeper at the moment and keep on doing so. Uh, it's, a, it's a big challenge, especially in this age where, as I've showed, the, the expertise has collapsed and trust has collapsed. So the question is whether we can do that again and prove Hayek wrong once more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daron. Some, some frightening futures uh, you've, you've painted for us there. Um, Okay, so we've got time for um, for some questions uh, now, and we've got some a couple of questions that have, have appeared in the Q and A that uh, the speakers might want to take a look at. And there's a question in the in the chat as well. As I mentioned, if you'd like to uh, click on raise your hand um, in the list of participants, then uh, we can get you uh, on live to uh, to put your questions to uh, to any of the speakers. Uh, so I'll come to some of the questions in the, in the moment, but Daron, you, you raised this issue about automation and technologies, and it, and it struck me about the, the issue about how automation relates to the, uh, the crisis and how we've responded to the pandemic. It's actually been incredibly helpful in, the, in that lots of us have been able to uh, work from home. Uh, we've been able to have a virtual economics con congress lasting a whole week here. Um, but of course, that, 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 as we know, has created a lot of, a lot of inequalities as well. How, how, how should we think about that sort of relationship between technologies and, and res response to the health emergency? Well, thank you. I mean, I think uh, it's a broader question than the health emergency, and I don't want to uh, answer, uh, I give a very long answer. So let me leave the health part aside, because I think that's quite well understood uh, how we can use technology and Taiwan and South Korea have done very well. But what I want to emphasize is that, of course, uh, as I also mentioned during my talk, we have depended crucially on digital technologies and we would have been in much hotter water without those digital technologies. But there's nothing in the nature of digital technologies that says that they should automate things. If you look at the, uh, think of all of your friends, Ramesh. You know, I'm sure you're a popular guy, you probably have a thousand friends. And imagine what their occupations are and go back 100 years how many of those occupations existed, or if it, they existed, how, how many of them really looked like what we were doing? And I think very, very few of them, of your friends, would be in that category. So you'll be some academics like us in there, but what we do is so different than what people did 100 years ago. Those are all thanks to new technologies, but those are not, does not, have not been automation technologies. Those have been technologies that have enriched the human role in the production process. This is what Pasquale and I call creation of new tasks. You know, programmers, 
uh, web, uh, <coughs> uh, web presenters, designers, uh, IT personnel, all of those are new tech, new tasks that have been created by technology. So that's where the critical difference between the four decades that after World War II and the current scenario is, because right now nobody is working to create these new tasks because the set of uh, blinders that many of the leaders of both in the policy and the economic world is that the best thing we can do is just get rid of the humans. Great, thanks. Fl Flavia, maybe, maybe you have some thoughts on this in terms of your, your, your thinking about social distancing uh, measures and you know, government's um, instructions to, to, um, to people to, to, how to how to prevent uh, the, 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 the disease um, spreading more, more rapidly. How, how, how do you think about that? You're, you're on mute. The, 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 you're on mute. The, 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 the most sorry, sorry. For the last six months. I, I didn't want to butt in on Daron, and now I, I basically uh, put a, a trap for myself. Okay, so uh, so I, I have of course been thinking about uh, how what are the things we could do, you know, to prepare for the next one. And I thought I thought a, a useful dichotomy would be between you know things that that um, that you know that prevent disease that is that uh, changes the contact patterns and and things that mitigate the economic effects that is that uh, allow us to not reduce our economic activity and uh, i'm not i'm no end expert on, on automation so i will defer to daron on that issue but it seems to me that uh, the more tasks that can be automated say in uh, in, uh, on, in on on production plans and so on the less need there would be for people to physically move from the workplace to uh, to the uh, to the factory, so uh, I suppose that it will have some effects. Uh, now, those people might want to do something else with their spare time rather than to go to the factory. So I don't know whether that is a solution, uh, but but unfortunately, that that's not something I've thought much about. Thanks, and uh, or Oriana, if, if uh, we come to you because uh, you you were thinking about um, much poorer parts of the world than than Daron was. Uh, was talking about uh, where, where I mean the, the, the opportunities to work from home are uh, far fewer and where it's it's far harder to socially distance in, in the way that of the two meters that we've been instructed in, in the UK for example. Um, how, how, do, how do you think about these uh, these issues around around technologies? Yeah, I think there is no doubt that the trade-offs are different and it's actually always surprises me how the policy response has been very similar despite these differences in trade-offs. Uh, the ECHO survey that uh, we ran in Bangladesh suggested that most people didn't have enough savings to last more than two weeks. So luckily the lockdown was uh, eased before most people ended up starving. But clearly the policy, the set of feasible policies is very different. And I think we should look at the trade-off a lot more carefully. Okay, well, let's, let's have a look at some of the, uh, the questions that have, that have come in in the chat. And as I say, if anyone wants to raise their hand and, and join the conversation, please, please do, uh, do feel free. Um, there's a question in the chat, uh, Daron, about where you got the, the, the data for your, for your trust in governments from. Perhaps you can tell us that. That's from the World Value Survey. Okay, okay, great. Um, and then a, a question from Milena Nikolova, who asks, is it possible that COVID actually slows down automation? Uh, I don't know if you can see see her full full question there in the uh, in the Q and A. If you want it's to, in the Q and A, I'll that. I'll look at it. I'll, I'll uh, it out for you. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, you know, if workers are so battered down that they can't ask for any wages below uh, above the some bare minimum, perhaps the cost pressure would be lower. I think not, because if you actually keep the chain of reasoning, the reason why their demands for higher wages would be lowered is precisely because there is more automation going on in part, and precisely because employers don't want to employ them given social distancing costs that are involved with workers. So at the end, I think, that would be an indirect effect that cannot dominate the direct effect. But there are many uh, sort of channels of influence from something that changes the organization of production. And, and also there are many other aspects that 
you know, uh, I haven't got into, you know, it would really depend on, you know, what's the nature of the innovation possibilities frontier between automation and other technologies. It well, well be that, you know, what we're seeing right now pushes automation ahead, but then later on other technologies catch up, or it could be more like a path dependent change where once you go a lot more into automation as we are doing, and again, for good reasons, like Flavio already mentioned, that's going to make it very difficult for other types of technologies to become competitive. So, so there are some, a lot of issues there to, 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 to investigate and we just don't have more data. We just don't have enough data on this other than these surveys that we're doing right now. Thanks. So well, everyone seems very shy on, on the chat. No, no one wants to uh, put their hand up and ask a question. Perhaps everyone's exhausted from five days of virtual conferencing. It's uh, perhaps even more exhausting than doing it in real life. Uh, but in, in the Q&A, uh, Kesha Batarai, who, who has been actually quite active in putting questions throughout the Congress, asks, on balance, is it right to say that the greater degree of democracy is more harmful for combating pandemics or for creating a welfare state? How can people ensure authoritarian government does not exploit them at undesirable levels? I guess, I guess that one's uh, directed at you again, uh, Daron, but if Flavio or Oriana wants to come in on that, do. Well, let's, uh, all I can say is what we know from historical data. And, uh, and, uh, uh, but, but, but I think the, the question was partly saying, perhaps the world has changed. I can't, I, I, that's, that's much harder. But what we know from historical data is that there have been a lot of claims about what democracies are bad at, etc. But when you look at the data carefully, many of the uh, sort of charges against democracy don't hold up. So what you see is that democracies grow quite a bit faster than non-democracies when you do the right sort of econometric control, essentially look at within country changes. And then the other thing is that democracies are just much, much better at building welfare state type things. So one of the biggest regularities is that democracies increase taxes and increase spending quite a bit. And a lot of it goes to uh, education and health. That's true both in the cross-country data and within country data. Uh, now, uh, again, the future may be very different precisely because of this trust and information related reasons. All of this data is up to the 2014, 13. Uh, so, you know, once we are in the world of Facebook where democratic uh, uh, communication becomes much harder democratic discourse becomes much more subject to sort of extremes and that when there are other things that have uh, perhaps uh, irreparably damaged trust in democratic governments that for a variety of reasons related to pre preference falsification or other things that haven't happened in more authoritarian governments perhaps the world is in the future is going to be different i uh, i don't think so but i could of course not give a categorical no to that question but again, my view remains that the best way of building better welfare states is by, by making our democracy work better. Could I ask a question? Go ahead. Yeah, so I have a question for Oriana. I don't know if you can answer this. Uh, you mentioned that the policy response has been remarkably similar across different countries, even though the trade-offs they face are very different. I suppose what you have in mind is that the health sector, say in Bangladesh, is very different from the one in, in, in Switzerland, say. Um, so, so that, that's kind of a puzzle. Could it be because uh, people were kind of taken unprepared and there was a copycat? So this is what, this is what best practice is. We're all gonna do the same. And that if we had had more time to prepare, there would have been a more sophisticated policy response? One would hope, but uh, I, I don't know the answer. Uh, but surely many countries like Uganda is another one that went into a full lockdown and therefore, like basically stopping even the most basic supplies getting into cities and people were starving. So they had to revert it quite quickly. Uh, Sub-Saharan African countries are sadly more used to this. And indeed, there were responses, say Sierra Leone, after the Ebola, managed to contain, I think, COVID a lot better than some of the neighbors. So maybe preparation does have a role to play. But I think we still know too little to, to know the answer to that. But I suspect that some coping was taking place. Yeah. I, I would hope that there's some kind of institutional memory. I know, for example, that in, uh, in Hong Kong and other places, because of the other epidemics that they've been exposed to, uh, 
even a week before there was a public lockdown, people were already buying face masks with disinfectants because they knew exactly what was coming. And I suspect that if we were to have another round of this, even in the West, people were already stocked up on many of the necessities that the, they would need. And one would hope that this would spread out also to institutions. If I, if I could make a comment on that, uh, Flavio. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, Flavio, you know this very well, but, but essentially if you look at the sort of SIR models with or without full immunity, essentially, you know, you have two qualitatively different strategies. You can either do enough lockdown so that you wait for the vaccine or you're going to just go for herd immunity. I think the concern is that the developing countries uh, may have done exactly the copying or, or have listened to the wrong advice that locked down early on, but then are going to open up and go for herd immunity anyway, in which case it's not going to be the optimal strategy except for flattening the curve, which I don't think was a big issue given that they are actually very young populations. So that would be the worst of all worlds. But so if you've done a very strict lockdown, like some of the countries have done, then you should really wait for the vaccine. But it's uncertain when they're going to get the vaccine. And the economy cannot really wait for the vaccine. So they may end up going for herd immunity anyway, which is really problematic. So I, I just wanted to come back to that point, actually. And, and, and I just had a comment that kind of ties together the three presentations that, I mean, Flavio, your first figure was really striking. The degree of uncertainty we face in the early stages given on just small changes in assumptions about uh, possibility to be reinfected. So is there a notion in which governments cannot profess that degree of uncertainty in the early stages of such a shock, because that would make it harder for them to implement policies as uncertainty gets resolved a little bit later? And is that potentially related to um, a, you know, a market for information in which many people are professing certainty about uh, various events, and possibly where lower income countries have to profess some way that they're, that, they're, that they're certain to the populations of, of what to do. So are we in a world in which governments cannot say we don't know what's going to happen and therefore you know, that that degree of uncertainty actually leads to, to, to more problems in, in a dynamic setting? I, I, think, I think it's an extremely difficult problem because either way you can't win. In some sense, if you say you know nothing, then you know, people might legitimately ask, well, why are you in control then if, if, if you know nothing? But then if, if you, you know, confidently state that this is the way the world is, and it turns out that it isn't, then you lose, you know, credibility. Uh, that is also a problem. And I think this is a fundamental issue about communicating science and communicating the basic uncertainties of the world. Um, so this is just a reflection of that fact into the policy sphere. But I think some humidity would be in order. I think maybe <laughs> ra rather than saying, you know, this is the, what the science says, then just acknowledge that there's a range of options and we are playing it safe, hoping uh, that, that, I mean, you know, your house did not burn down and somebody comes and tells you, well, the, the insurance was in vain. So, well, no, because we were just really locked out. If it had burned down, we would have really needed it. And maybe that's kind of the humidity we should, we should try to, uh, to foster. So Flavio, there's a related question in the Q&A about how, to the extent to which your, your models are being used in government. How, 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 how much is, is, is in their applicability in, in real policy during, during this pandemic? Or, I mean, it, my, my, my models? Yeah. They have been grossly underused. <laughs> <laughs> so we haven't been following the science. No. Oh, let, 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 let me... Uh, so... Um, I know most about the, the, the policy response in the UK. Unfortunately, for historical reasons, the, the government has sought advice from several different constituencies that had kind of been tasked with, with, with covering specific bits of, of, the, of the puzzle. So you had the, uh, the epidemiologists who uh, have very sophisticated models, but really don't deal very well with behavior. And then on the other hand, so these are basically doing projections using basic, basic and mathematical models. On the other hand, they've had a group of what they call the behavioral scientists, which are a, um, a, a complex uh, you know, group of, of, uh, of psychologists, uh, behavioral economists, and so on, who, uh, well, not that many behavioral economists, but some of them who have known very little in general about the economy. And then you've had the treasury economists trying to deal with the economic fallout. Unfortunately, this is a crisis that really marries all those bits of the puzzle in a very unique way. And so I don't think the scientific advice that has been sought has been you know, faulty 
It's just that you've asked questions to different people rather than to ask people who might go across all those different disciplines and think carefully about that. So I don't, I'm not advocating you should hire people that know everything, but at least bring people together that know uh, some bits and get them to talk. And so you're going to have a coherent uh, response to, uh, to these issues. So no, I can't say that my, my specific research has been uh, used as much as I would have liked it to be. Uh, but uh, I, I'm hoping uh, that going forward, that there's been a, uh, at least a recognition that uh, that more interdisciplinary work in this field is useful, not just as sci scientific curiosity, but actually some uh, something that can give uh, practical uh, policy advice. Excellent. I don't know if any of the other uh, panelists have thoughts about other, other governments sort of, uh, that have um, been more effective in their use of the science. I don't know. Uh, Oriana, whether you have any thoughts on countries with which you're familiar, or, or Daron, the, the US, of course, I'm sure has really followed the science. Yes, yes. Uh, I, think, I think with a negative sign, it's done perfectly. <laughs> um, Oriana, uh, Imran, any, any uh, thoughts on other countries with which you're familiar? It's kind of uh, tempting to do generalizations, but of course, it's too early to say. I think Pakistan has done extremely well, but whether that's because of the policy of the government or just sheer luck, we never know. But it is one country where for a long time they debated whether to go into full lockdown or not. And then it was decided that it would be too costly. And as Daron was saying, that it would be much worse to go into lockdown and then revert it before the right time. And so they only did local measures and they're now doing very well, but cause and effect are very hard to disentangle. Yeah. Uh, Daron, there's, there's a couple more questions for you in the Q&A if you want to take a look at those and maybe come back to those in a moment. But there's a uh, interesting question. We've been talking about the, the, the uh, crisis uh, creating greater inequality, but uh, there's a question from Rafat Mahmoud who says, do you think the pandemic offers an opportunity for catch up to countries with population ratios skewed towards youth? Anyone want to pick that up? I think the effect would have to be pretty enormous because if you compare the, the countries that you're thinking about are countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, the population is very young. Um, of course, there will be, for what we know about the virus, they will be hit less hard. But the difference, the sheer difference is so enormous that I don't think unless you know, the current rich countries get hit way harder than we think. I don't think in the grand scale of things, the effect on inequality is going to be visible. Okay, uh, Daron, did you want to pick up any of the, the questions in the, in the Q&A, respond to anything there? No, I'm, I think I'm all right. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Well, we, we've run over a little bit of time. I'm just going to put a last question to everybody. This has been a, it feels to me that this has been an exciting few months for economic research. It's been a devastating one for, for the world and for friends and family everywhere, but it seems a very positive one for economics. I'd be interested in some re reflections on, on um, what, the, what this means for economics going forward. The, the last big crisis, the global financial crisis, we got a hard time. Is, is, this, is this a better time for us? But we can't be accused of not seeing this coming because obviously it's not for us to foresee. But I was personally very impressed on how quickly people stood up to the challenge and how much good research has been generated and how, you know, in general, the profession has been very responsive to, to the need of society. Darren, yeah, I how, completely how agree with that. I completely agree with that. I think, I think it's a dark hour for the world, but the uh, economics profession has uh, shown itself in a better light, uh, getting engaged with the issues of the time and, uh, and, and being very flexible and data driven and doing a good job of uh, using the right type of theory. Uh, of course, we've built on the shoulders of people like Flavio who've been doing this for a while, but uh, still, it was great to see that from the young economists all around the world. Excellent. Flavio, you've, you've, you've been joined by the whole of the profession now in an area where you were, you were very much on your own. <laughs> how, how does that feel? Well, it's a bit odd. It's, it, it's a, it, I don't know. I, I'm very happy. I'm very happy that, uh, that the people are interested in this work. And I, I think it's for everyone's benefit that we are interested in these world things. Um, so great. One thing I, I would like to point out uh, as a humorous uh, aside, 
is that uh, epidemiologists are basically finding themselves in, in a position that economists have been finding themselves in for years with people criticizing what they're doing and now suddenly becoming experts in what they're doing uh, from one day to the other um, and also are now facing what happens if your predictions don't come to, uh, to, to materialize the way you've said they would. Um, so uh, that, that's kind of interesting to see that uh, many of the same issues we have been battling with uh, as in terms of public relations towards society, epidemiologists are now experiencing those same issues. So, uh, so welcome to them. <laughs> Great. Well, I'm, I'm going to hand over to Imran in, in a moment, but uh, to, to, to wrap things up and he can, maybe he can reflect on this. Um, but let me say uh, thank you to, for the questions. Thank you to all the, all the participants. And, and thank you, Flavio, Daron and, and Oriana for fantastic presentations and thank great you. discussion with us now. Over, you. over to you, Imran and Oriana, to, to wrap up the Congress. Thanks, thanks, Ramesh. Uh, yeah, let me just wrap up by thanking all three panelists again for donating their time today and for three excellent talks. I think, as we were just saying, that, uh, the, the work that's been presented sort of collectively highlights the extent to which economists have been fully engaged with helping uh, society, helping policymakers, and indeed helping other economists understand what are the implications of the crisis and what are the choices we face and how to respond to the new challenges that it's raised. Uh, this is going to be an event that's almost surely going to be studied for, for many years ahead. Um, I just want to wrap up by wishing everyone a safe and healthy start to the new academic year and hope to see many of you in person in better times. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. But just before we conclude, I'm going to hand back over to Oriana for some final words of thanks. Thank you. I changed my heart. I come here now as a vice president of the VEA to officially conclude the first virtual Congress. I hope that you have learned as much and enjoyed it as much as I have. Uh, however, being involved in the organization, mostly as a spectator, I have a vantage viewpoint. And there is one thing that made me enjoy this Congress even more. And that is that even though the Congress is virtual, the people organizing it are very real. And seeing like how everyone from the students in Rotterdam to um, the RM phase here or Gemma transformed a challenge into an outstanding success made me very hopeful for the future and not just that of the EEA. So I'm sure you will want to join me in thanking them. And I look forward to seeing you next year in some European capital in cyberspace. We'll be there. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>